Uh, good morning, everyone. God bless you. It's good to be here with you and to study together and to discuss together. So I've got uh, a topic for today is the, the death of Lazarus. That's a, kind of a deep topic. And when you get started with it, you realize that there's quite a few pieces to it to uh, think clearly on it and to, to uh, enjoy it. But it's only in one place in the Bible. <laughs> And that happens to be John chapter 11. So we'll talk about the uh, death and resurrection of Lazarus as a picture of what Jesus was going to be going through in those same days, just following. Just, wow, how close it was. Um, it gets you excited when you actually delve into it and realize how many days he was here, how many days was there, how many days was he in dying, I guess you might say, for Lazarus. And then uh, they had to get message to Jesus. Jesus had to get there, and Jesus had to bring him back to life. And, and here's the Passover at the same time. <laughs> wow. So it gets pretty interesting when you start studying the timing in between and, and where they were. So let's, let's go for it. Uh, in John chapter 11, I'm going to stay there a little bit. So turn your Bibles to chapter 11. And... Uh, John chapter 11. Like I say, I got two kinds of magnifying glasses so that if I need it big, I'll, I'll do that. If I need a small area, I can use that. Uh, we've got one in every room now, I think. <laughs> okay, John chapter 11, starting with verse 1. I know I've got some things in here that I'm quite concerned about making sure that we notice and that we talk about. In... Uh, a certain man was sick. His name was Lazarus. You know, almost by the time I get done, I, I was thinking, oh my, they could have made that a little more friendly for, for Lazarus. <laughs> but um, uh, we'll find that. And he was of Bethany. So uh, right away, oh boy, I just like that. I might as well get this book out of my way. I started looking in the back of the Bible for, for uh, maps. And I started looking in other places for maps. And I had that big one that folds out that big. Uh, no, no, I, I can't do that. <laughs> it's got every page folds again and again and again and again. Uh, but it's fantastic for timing, for who was where, and uh, what they were doing. But this map will work fine. The back of your Bible will probably work real fine. So I just picked a page. And you kind of want this kind of a page when you're looking in the back of your Bible so that it's got the whole top to bottom of the basic 12 tribes uh, in one place. So if you could find that, maybe it would help you. But also, if you look up where, where Bethany is, well, you actually find out that you have Jerusalem, Bethlehem, what did they say? Bethany and Bethlehem. <laughs> They're kind of in a triangle. And they're all about uh, 70 miles or so. It's, uh, it'll come up here as to how far it was to walk and how long it was to get from one to the other and whether you're going uphill or downhill. Uh, maps like these also have a good thing on the side. They've got a map of Jerusalem City right in, in here as well so that when Jesus was taken from place to place, you can actually follow where he was. So that's, uh, yeah, when I... I knew that they were close together, and then I realized, oh, they're a triangle, kind of like that, you know, uh, the three cities. Uh, Bethlehem being down, kind of south and uh, west, and Jerusalem's kind of up in the middle of those three dots, but a little bit to the east. And then there's Mount of Olives, and you go down the hill there to Bethany. So it wasn't very far from uh, this family that's in this story. So... A certain man, and he was from Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister, Martha. Uh, you wonder sometimes they're saying quite a bit of information uh, and it's stacking on each other. So uh, let it sink in, take a little time there. And who is this Mary? Oh, it says it right there in verse 2. Mary that anointed Jesus with ointment and wiped his, his feet, uh, anointed his feet and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother... Lazarus was sick. So now you're trying to get the family together. Who's who? Mary, 
and Martha were sisters, and their brother was Lazarus. Verse 3, therefore the sisters sent, and it, you can go past that so fast, I, I actually caught it this morning. How did they get a message to Jesus? Well, they sent a message. It's like in those days they had a post you know, system or a horse system or mailing system. They, they could get message through pretty fast. It wasn't very far away. So they sent unto him. They didn't go themselves. Saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Presumably they meant he's still alive. <laughs> okay. uh, it's just by a shave, though, when you look through the hours and the number of days and so on. Um, when Jesus heard that, he, he said, this sickness is not unto death. He's giving consolation and help to those that are going to be grieving or are grieving at this point. He said, it's not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of Man might be glorified thereby. So you're going to watch what's going to happen, okay? Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus separately and in between each one. He loved them all equally, siblings of the family. When he had heard, therefore, that he, that would be Lazarus, was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Wow. Why didn't you run quickly? Why didn't you go in a hurry? Uh, you have to throw in a few things about uh, the time of the day, um, whether it's going to be daylight or dark, or whether you're going to get in trouble with the dark and so on. So you, you have to kind of say, okay, he knew what he was doing and it needed that time. So he abode two more days, still, still there in that same place where he was. Verse 7. Then after that, uh, said he unto his disciples, let us go to Judea again. Judea? Wait a minute, that's that away. You're going to Jerusalem, you're going the wrong way. And the disciples caught on that real quick in verse 8. They said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. Goest thou there again? You're going to go thither? Go, go over there again? Right away, right now? And Jesus changes the subject. Interesting. He wasn't concerned about where he was needing to go and who, what timing it was and who was sick. And so he said, uh, are there not 12 hours in the day? Even right there, you can stop and say, wow. Some nations try to teach us and churches try to teach us that these people were all ignorant and dumb and whatever. They didn't know how to count days and they didn't know the numbers. Uh, you know, man, you go through the Bible and you, I was going to bring about that many books. <laughs> of history to show man was very wise. They knew what they were doing. They could go in shipping. They were knowing where the land was. They drew maps. Uh, my goodness. Uh, they knew that there's 12 hours in the day and thus 12 hours in the night. And how far is it around the world? It takes the sun 12 plus 12, 24 hours, and it goes around the full circle, okay? Uh, they were not ignorant. So even right here, we caught something. Uh, if any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because there's daylight. Because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. The subject is spiritual and physical. He's comparing the two so you can get the, catch the message, catch, catch the thought. He's saying you could go. And by the way, when you get to that and you say, no, I wonder, what's he talking about? What, how many hours? How dark is it? What is it? Spring equinox? Equal night, equal day? Okay. When's the Lord's Supper and the Passover? At the spring equinox. There's 12 hours of light. When they left Egypt, what time of day was it when they could leave? The moon was up. It's full moon. Right here, this is full moon. You're not going to stumble in the night if you get light of the moon. But this was a good point to point out to the people. Trust in God. God's going to see to this thing through. God knows that Nazareth is sick. They don't know how bad off he is yet, but it's, it's coming. 
So he said, don't worry about whether we're going to, um, to Judea or whether we're going to see this family. Or, don't worry about it. It's taken care of. God's got it in hand. In fact, he needed a little more time. If, he, if Nazareth had died five minutes later, he, he was raised by Jesus. That's no big deal, right? Jesus can do that. What if he was dead 12 hours, 24 hours, four days? He was dead four days by the time Jesus got there. Is that a miracle? Oh boy, that's a biggie. <laughs> so God knew what he was doing. Jesus knows what he's doing. He's depending on the Father's nudge. Do this first, do that second. So then he said, uh, uh, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of, the, out of sleep. Again, the disciples are, well, what are you talking about, Lord? Uh, is he well? You know, what's going on? Uh, so then the disciples said, uh, if he sleepeth, he do well. He must be getting better because he's quiet and comfortable. And albeit Jesus spoke of his death. So we need that in our translation, in our thinking, that Jesus knew that he was dead. They, they thought that he had spoken of the rest in sleep. So they had the wrong kind of sleep going. So when somebody says to you, oh, you guys believe in uh, sleep in the grave or uh, some other term indicating about the same thing. Yes, we do. This is, this is why Jesus is using those terms. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. That's plain, short, sweet. Yeah, you got it. Verse 15. And I am glad for your sake that I was not there. Why? Jesus needed to do a miracle. God was in this thing. God was wanting to do this. He said, I'm glad I wasn't. If I'm heart sick and over this problem, I might move too fast and get ahead of God. Oh no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> right? He needed to wait on God. So he said, I'm glad I wasn't there. The miracle would be bigger if he wasn't there and he got there and everybody understands he was dead, he was in the tomb and so on, uh, the miracle is bigger. For your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. To the intent that ye might believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. They could believe how powerful Jesus is, how much authority he has in the spiritual world and, and this healing thing. They could understand that better if they had a little weight. Well, Thomas put his oar in, as they say. And uh, he wanted to know, uh, uh, let us also go that we may die with him. Got the wrong idea. That's not what Jesus was trying to figure out here. Verse 17. Um, or when Jesus came, he found that he had laid in the grave for four days already. Already. Wow. Let's keep going. Now Bethany was nigh to Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs. Well, in my center reference, it says about two miles. No problem. They were used to walking a lot, so no problem. And uh, many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. And Martha, then Martha was, as uh, soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. And Mary sat still in the house. Doesn't mean that she didn't move a finger. She, you, know, you say, wait until I come. You, you can wiggle. <laughs> so this still means that she just stayed there. That's another way of wording it in English language. She stayed there where she was. Didn't get excited. Didn't jump up. She had company there. So she stayed in the house. And Martha went to Jesus. Lord, if thou hast... In here, my brother had not died. That's an honest question. I wish he had been here. But I know that even now, whatsoever, the light on this magnifier helped you. Uh, whatever, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. And Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And, you know, okay. 
And Martha said unto him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She understood the doctrine, you might say. She understood the teachings of God, the teachings of the Bible. Uh, yeah, he's coming back. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So he's not missing anything by being dead right now. He won't be left behind. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Okay, Lord, you've asked a hard question. See what happens here. And she said unto him, Yea, it's yes, I got it. I believe it. Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, which should come into the world. She understood exactly his position. Whatever name they call him, you know, master in other places, uh, she knew exactly what was going on here. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly. Keep this quiet, keep this noise down, don't bring the whole crowd, don't have people run on Jesus, uh, saying, the master is come. They knew exactly again what he's talking about. The master calleth for thee. So this is verse 28, 29. This is John, just in case we keep up with each other. <laughs> uh, chapter 11, verse 29. So then she, when she'd heard that, she rose quickly, but probably carefully. She rose quickly and came unto him. And it doesn't say ran to him. You know, she didn't make a fuss. Now Jesus was not yet come to the town. So he was outside of the city, outside of the town, but was in the place where Martha had met him. So Martha could tell her he's by that tree or by that resting place. And the Jews which were with her in the house and comforted her, and comforted her uh, when they saw that Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, she goeth into the grave to weep. Uh-huh. If they had said Jesus, they would have stormed her, run her over probably in the door for him, okay? So they, she just went about her business, and they thought she's going to the grave. 32. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down. This is a form of worshiping or kneeling before somebody else. The other, Jesus might have been sitting and she just got down to his level. Okay, whatever it was, she did this properly and appropriately. Fell down at his feet and said unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Boy, that's, that's belief. That's powerful belief. My brother would not have died. Jesus is the healer. Jesus would have been there. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came after her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? It's sort of just to get the conversation started. Where did you lay him? He could have looked around, but he was in a different place, and he said, Where have you laid him? And said unto him, Lord, come and see. Sometimes we got to get out of our comfort zone and go and see. <laughs> see what's going on. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. And when the Jews behold, behold uh, how, oh, the, the Jews said, Behold how much he, that's Jesus, loved Nazareth, loved him. There was a connection there that they could put that together pretty easy. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind, caused that even this man should not have died. Yeah, he could. Okay? Sometimes we've got to wait on the Lord. We've got to wait on the Heavenly Father. We've got to be ready to respond. But don't get ahead of things. And Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave uh, 
it was a cave that was co very common for them to dig a cave into the hillside and uh, they'd make it big enough that they could bury two or three people there and so that was, this is common. And a stone was laid upon it. Uh, sometimes I think over the top, no. They made a hole in the side wall and they'd have a track where you could roll this big rolling wheel of a stone to close the, the tomb, but you could still open it later. Put somebody else in there as well. And Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. It's a rolling stone. Martha, his, uh, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. And he, for he hath been dead four days. Real obvious way of understanding. He's been dead four days. And uh, he's going to be stinking. You know, I got to thinking about this as I went on with the sermon. I thought, there's an awful lot of people that stink because they're not saved. They're dead on their feet. They don't know that they're dying and that they're dead and that they're going to go to the hot spot and the bad place. Or, um, why would they call for the rocks and the hills to fall on them? They know their place. They know what's happening, what's going on. So yeah, they're dead on their feet. And they stink. <laughs> you think of their behaviors, their mannerisms, their actions. And, oh man, what awful stuff. Well, I got a little here in the sermon. I'll probably leave some of it out for you to think over. But four days. Jesus said unto her, uh, Say I not unto thee that if, remember to watch for those, if thou wouldest believe, Sometimes we were challenged. Remember Jesus talking with his disciples, and oh, ye of little faith, and so on. Yeah, we we got to hang in there. We got to wake ourselves up. Thou shouldest, if you believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Yeah, we'd like to, but you know we're in this dilemma. The the, the beloved one is dead. When they took away the stone from the place where the dead laid, Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. He had a relationship with his father, and he said, I'm glad you're listening, and I'm glad I can pray to you. You know, this sort of idea. And I knew that thou hearest me always. That's true. But believe, but be, because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. He can connect the dots. If this is Jesus' Father and somebody sent Jesus to earth and you, know, you put the dots together, yeah, Jesus sent, was sent by the Heavenly Father. This is something that they could hang on to afterwards. And when he said thus, he spoke and cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, and his grave clothes with binding him, and, he, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth, and he had a, have a napkin type thing. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. People standing by, the ones that rolled the stone and so on, anybody near, help get the clothes off of this man. Get him out of that stuff. And many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, and said, believed on Jesus. Believed on Jesus. But some of them went their way uh, to the Pharisees and told them uh, what things they had seen Jesus do, and what, he, what Jesus had done. Uh, they were squealers, tattletales. They were hoping to get Jesus in trouble. You know, you go on and on. They were um, some of those types. So anyway, that tells what happened there, that he was saved. And then the story kind of quits for a moment. Lazarus is, is well. He's up, around. So the story changes at that point. And you have to go down. It talks about these some miracles, man of miracles and so on. Um, but uh, I, I, let's see, I'm going to get my paper over here. I won't be so long on other verses. <laughs> um, okay. If we uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to take the very next verse, but hang on to this spot because I'm coming back to chapter 12 for just a couple of verses. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Get two hands up there. Ephesians chapter 2. Chapter 2, and start with verse 1. And you had he quickened, the Heavenly Father. And, you know, when you're reading here, you're in a different setting. Paul is talking. So he said, but, he's, but God has quickened you. Who were dead in transgressions and sin. Yeah, they're dead. How did they get there? Well, we'll, we'll get a little bit here. We're in, uh, in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, the spirit which now worketh in children of disobedience, that's Satan. You were there yourselves. You know better. You know what I'm talking about. You know, that's what, what Paul is saying. Among whom also we all had our conversation, mannerisms, behaviors, actions, you know, conversation as well, in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the, of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he has loved us, even when we were dead in sin. So you can make a connection here pretty easy. If you're not in Christ, you're dead already. You're just walking dead. Because you're going to the hot spot. Okay? You've got to get Jesus in your life. Even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. Wow. That can wake us up. We want out of the mess we're in. We're out of this mess of this world and all the bad things that are going on, the horrible things that we hear about. Don't even want to put the news on anymore. They give you, you know, three to five seconds, maybe ten if you're on the outside, of actual news. And then you got the rest of the, the time in commercials that are gross, miserable. This is the world that we're in. We were in that. We were dead. So we need Jesus. Let's go to John, um, John eleven thirty nine. It's telling there that oh, that's where the says stink. <laughs> you, you look at the things that we're going to come to just in moments here, and they stink. They're bad, miserable. Okay, so let's go to Romans chapter one. Romans chapter 1, and verse 18. Chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Wow. They hold truth, but they keep it in, in blackness and darkness and bad. And then you can read on down here and further and further and further. And they possess themselves to be wise. I'll tell you what it's all about. I can tell you how it goes, how it works. The next words, they became fools. They do not know the Word of God. They do not know how God's system works and glory that is mentioned here. But they build something out of uh, birds or mud or dirt or wood that looked like birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And what did they do? They bow down to them. They worship them. They try to get away with something there. So verse 23, at least, you've got to go that far. Then uh, you can read the rest there from 24 on to the end of the chapter. It doesn't get prettier and it doesn't get better. That's what mankind is like. They've got reprobate mind is written in there. They don't know the air of their way. 
Um, just glance over it and then come back to read it later. They're disobedient to parents. It names a whole bunch of things. Backbiters, haters of God. And then it says oh, disobedient to parents. This is the awful side of everything. They don't realize that they're consenting. In the margin it says consents with. They're going along with what's going on. The judgment of man over the judgment of God. They don't want the Bible. They're worthy of death themselves. But they're consenting along with other people. They're doing the same kind of thing. Okay. Let's go to... Well, I won't read it. But I'll give it to you. Titus chapter 3.3. 3. That's going to be easy to remember. A little book of Titus and 3.3. 3. The same word, same story is there. So that's a double witness for us. How bad can mankind be? They stink. It's awful. Okay, let's go to uh, Romans 5. Romans um, chapter 2, 3, 4, 5. Here's chapter 5 and verse 6. Five. And verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, babes in Christ, if not less than that, in due time Christ died, for the ungodly. You've got to put these verses kind of together and say, what happened? Well, before I knew better, before I was involved, before I heard the story, Christ already died for me. God already had the plan made. Christ died for the ungodly. For the ungodly, not the good people. He died for everybody. The ungodly got into it too. Okay, I want to step forward and teeny bit here. Um, oh, I want to make sure we get verse 8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't know better, didn't want to know better, didn't, uh, you know. And still God had the plan made and it was, it was waiting for you. That way it would be made perfect there. So going to uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you, this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, I delivered this message unto you. First of all, that which I also received, he received it, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Paul figured this out. He went back, studied those verses. He met with Jesus in, in the desert, right? Oh, Okay. Um, he got this firsthand. He received it. He accepted it. He understood it and understood it well enough to teach others that this story about Jesus is true. Jesus is the one that can heal us and bring us out of the mess that we're in. Sinners must die for sins. That's a true statement. Or, you want to get around it, get away from it, have a sinless substitute to die for him. They would have a lamb that did nothing wrong, no blemish, nothing. That baby, baby lamb, that little one, had to die for your sins. Now what? Well, Christ came to be that lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus represented all the lambs that were in the Old Testament, all the sacrifices that were given for sins. And they, re they received forgiveness for it. But here it is, back with us again. So we'd have a sinless substitute, which was Jesus Christ. I want to go um, to uh, in John 14, John, John, pardon me, John chapter 11, 44. The man that was brought out of the tomb, Lazarus, he was still bound. And we know about Satan's binding. <laughs> well, he was bound with um, his hands and feet and clothing were bound. And uh, he had a cloth over his face. And Jesus said, let him loose. Let him go. So where do we fit in this? It's a two-fact miracle here was happening. Uh, if we put Je Jesus saves sinners, that's a true statement. So let's look a little at that. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 5, it says, the moment a sinner believes, what happens? 
Well, there's, there's words like engrafted or grafted or grafted in that are used to explain what happens. We get accepted. We're allowed to be a child of the Heavenly Father. We're allowed to uh, be an inheritor. We, we, uh, you can say, well, you're, you were grafted into the set of believers, the church, the believers. Some people don't want to hear that because it's like Old Testament. You're going to go back into Old Testament. It's not the same. The New Testament re, uh, believers and what they believed is not the same as the Jews and so on the Old Testament. It's different, but that's a still the same process. We're grafted in. What's James chapter 1 say? Verse 21. James chapter 1. Chapter 1 and verse 21. 21. Wherefore, lay up lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and superfluity uh, and receive with meekness the engrafted word the scriptures which it is able to save your souls in Sabbath school class we're studying souls <laughs> here's another verse that would go with the souls we need to put aside all these other things, get rid of them, naughtiness, and um, get yourself engrafted into the spiritual life and get into the church and into the fellowship and the belief in Jesus Christ. But we need to get that fixed, get it done. Uh, jump over to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Just picking up a few words, you might say, that can be used, like being grafted in. In John chapter 5, and 39 and 40. 39, search the Scriptures. Yeah, that's where you need to be, studying the Scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, testify of Jesus. And ye will not come in... Come, in, come to me that ye might have life. You, you won't come. That's not normal. You have to figure this out for yourself. Figure out the scriptures. Figure out salvation plan. What's the words you're going to use? How do you pray to the Heavenly Father? How do you pray to Jesus? You need to do some work. And I will receive honor from, me, from men. Okay, I'm going to jump away from that and go on to, uh, I've got a Colossians 3, and it's got two things there that I want to get, and Ephesians 4. So we'll try to get these all together here. And uh, so I'm going to look at Colossians 3 first. Use Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3 is the main one, but we, we want to pick up a little more so we can make it a little wider when we go back to uh, another couple of verses. So in Colossians 3, 1, 2, 3, and we can even take 4 because it'll save us turning a page as we go along. So chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be raised with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Really consider what's going on here. Are you baptized? Are you seeking Christ? Have you joined Christ? There's a number of things that are going on here. If you're raised with Christ, we say, well, we bury them in the water of baptism and rise in newness of life. Okay, we could use all those verses, right? So that's what's going on here. If you are, seek those things which are above. Seek Christ that sits on the right hand of God. You've got a perfect avenue there to talk with Him. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is 
our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That part you've got to get fixed. It's like when Jesus talked with the master and he said, you've got to be born again. He couldn't get it. You, you, we've got to think deeper on these things and set these verses against other verses and say, okay, now I'm understanding this. You need to turn to Christ, live for Christ. Okay, stepping aside from there, uh, we need to know that there's something flowing when you come out of the grave, when you go into the baptism water and, and a dead, you die, leave the old man in the grave. You know, those verses. Uh, when you come out of there, we need to say, let me loose, let me go. <laughs> uh, take this old nature of mine. Get rid of it. That's in Ephesians chapter 4. That should tie this all together. I'm going to hold that Colossians for a moment too. Uh, Ephesians. Here's Ephesians. Chapter 4. Chapter f yeah, Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 22. And it's over. Yeah, at the bottom of the page here. That uh, ye put off concerning, put, put away something, get rid of it. The former conversation of the old man. Get rid of him. Get him out of here. Which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man. Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Put away, put away lying. Every man speak truth with his neighbor. You become members one of another. You can keep going, you see. That's what we need to be doing. There's something to do. And that Colossians 4, there's also a verse, um, Colossians 3, and verse 17 in that same chapter that we're in. Colossians 3, what's verse 17 say? And whosoever ye do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Neat. We need to know those verses exist and, and hang, into, hang on to them. What's going to happen? Well, think of this. When Jesus arrived with, uh, there with Lazarus, I don't want to take too long here. I guess I'm okay yet, since lunch is here at church. <laughs> um, in chapter 12, John chapter 12, First couple of verses. What was going on there? Okay. Chapter 12. 1 and 2. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Six days difference from this other chapter. Just six days. The time of the year, the sunset, the moonrise, moonset, um, the Passover, it's all, all here, all in just a package, little package. Uh, in Bethany, where Lazarus was, uh, was, and which had been dead, whom he raised from the, grave, from the dead. That's Jesus did the, raising him from the dead. Uh, there they made him a supper. And Martha served, and Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. This was not hidden. Martha takes oil and anoints his body, his feet, and his, dries it with her hair. Right there in verse 3. This is not hidden. There was a lot of other people around too. The twelve apostles were here. This wasn't a hidden message or something that you have to worry about. It was there. And how much was this oil? 300 pence. That's about 300 days pay if you look at the one where they got a penny for a day's work. Wow. And he could have been sold and given to the poor. No, he wasn't worried about that, really. He just wanted to keep the money. Jesus had to say, leave her alone. She bought this and is doing this for my burial. Verse 7. 
There's only a few days left of his life. He wants to eat the Passover with Lazarus. And he did. It's, this would be obvious. It's so close. It's a day or so away. Yeah, that he could have it. To be able to be with his family. And when the uh, the Jews and Pharisees and so on heard about these things, down to verse 11, uh, well, verse 10, the chief priests consulted with one another because, because uh, Lazarus was there and he'd been dead and raised. And now he's making a ruckus in the city. <laughs> you know, there's another meal going on here. What's going on? Verse 11, because that by reason of him, Lazarus, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we need to tell this story. We need to get the story across. Okay. First uh, John uh Chapter 1, yeah, First John is another verse I want here. So Jesus was eating with them and uh, fellowshipping with them in their home. And days from now, he was going to be dead. First John 1 and verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We've got to have verses like that that fit into our, our reading and our way of mannerism, our, uh, our fellowship. Our, you know, When we have Passover, no, we don't do the Passover part, we do the Lord's Supper part. But when you're there washing one another's feet, fellowshipping, talking with one another, breaking bread to represent Jesus Christ, we have fellowship. We have definitely a big fellowship. Okay, as the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all sins. Uh, they were yeah, in, in the household where Martha and Lazarus and Mary were, they were eating with Jesus. And some couldn't believe that Jesus came back from the dead or that Lazarus came back from the dead. There's obvious proofs that this was a real story, a real thing that happened. Resurrection of Nazareth, of Lazarus was a testimony. Tell your story. Tell your testimony. How did you come to know Jesus Christ? What has he done for you? What does the saving grace of Jesus Christ mean to you? That is in chapter 12. John chapter 12. We were just there. I turned the page back. <laughs> I can get back there pretty quick. Uh, John chapter 12. In verse uh, 9, much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. They wanted to see the miracle. Let's go over to that house over there because a miracle happened. I want to hear what they say. You know, they, you know, they didn't have television. <laughs> So they went over. So they're listening and watching. One more verse, verse 11. Because that by reason of him, Lazarus, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. No, it, we could duplicate that, couldn't we? We could tell the story, make it completely believable by all the scriptures that are available. Tell people, read the Old Testament, read the New Testament, read this part, read that part. Read just the four Gospels. Read just John. Make it easy for them. There's a man in Canada. He took the book of John, became a Christian with his family, sent back home to, to India for his wife to come to him. If they weren't married, they, they were espoused to be married, and you'd have to uh, close the deal yet somewhat. But they'd have a go-between person. He sent the book of John in a single volume to his espoused wife and said, read this. This is what I believe. This is who I am. You're going to be marrying me. This is who I am. She read it and converted her whole family. <laughs> All right, there's power in the blood. There's power in the Word of God. And we need to be looking for places to witness and to testify and to call people out, tell them what's here 
what's there, what you can find. Um, if they want to study the Bible, Wednesday night is a fantastic place to study the Bible because we can sit down and visit one-on-one -on -one, and we get into some meaty stuff. <laughs> if you've been going there, you'll know that we really get into the meat of the Word and uh, we hope that we can all enjoy the Word of God and uh, spread the gospel that way. God bless you.